you know, like I said, but in most cases, these institutions, both in the center and particularly on the local level, uh, lack uh, capacity and resources to deliver basic uh, services which the people of Afghanistan uh, demand. We hope that in the next uh, uh, five years, we will be assisted uh, both in terms of resources and building an institutional capacity to help implement the uh, national development strategy of Afghanistan, which we presented to the international community uh, just uh, uh, last year uh, at a conference in uh, Paris. Uh, if you are interested in uh, knowing about the te details, I invite you to read a copy uh, of the uh, 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 strategy, an exact summary of the uh, strategy online. Again, it's the Afghanistan National Development Strategy. It's online. Uh, there's a website. You can get it from there. Thank you. You can also get more information about uh, Afghanistan overall at the uh, embassy website, embassyofafghanistan.org. Our last call for uh, Ashraf Hadari comes from Denver and Jamal on our line for Democrats. Hey, good morning. Go ahead, Jamal. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be on. Thanks again, C-SPAN, for all of your coverage. Uh, I'm going to use a bit of an analogy. I think that the world is kind of like, a, a, let's say, a neighborhood. And um, we're all in the neighborhood in different houses, and Afghanistan is a drug house in a big neighborhood. And they're producing uh, drugs out of their house, and they're not able to keep their children in line. You're telling your children to come over to other people's houses, rob and cause destruction and mayhem. And then you want us to come into your house, out of our house, and police you, get your house in line, get your people in line and then finance for you to have a bigger and better new house. But that opium that you're growing, you can grow corn or grain. It doesn't have to be opium. And uh, you guys have some type of oil reserves there where you guys sit at. I know there's some water or something in those mountains. We're going to leave it there, Jamal. We're running out of time. Ashraf Hadari, go ahead. I think I disagree with the analogy. The fact is that the uh, Afghan culture, the Afghan constitution, and also uh, uh, Islam, of course, uh, Afghans are predominantly Muslim, are all against cultivation, production, and abuse of drugs in Afghanistan. If the people of Afghanistan were given a choice, particularly those poorest of the poor sharecroppers who cultivate opium poppy for livelihood, in absence of uh, livelihood, legal livelihood, if they were given a choice between uh, a legal of course livelihood and of course opium poppy cultivation they would definitely go with uh, that legal livelihood uh, just as long as it's enough to support uh, their family and like I said then there's also uh, for supply there's always demand even if we resolve the problem in Afghanistan the supply would move from uh, Afghanistan into another uh, area or country where rule of law is weak, where security is weak, where unfortunately um, uh, there are no jobs, where uh, people just uh, out of uh, necessity and uh, poverty uh, might resort to uh, cultivation. So that's why we need to fight it uh, not only at the supply end but also uh, at the uh, demand end. Uh, we know that the government of uh, this country is spending some $44 billion a year to fight drug uh, Direct related uh, violence and, and crime. So together with Europe, there are some uh, over uh, 100 uh, billions of uh, dollar, 100 billion dollars spent on uh, fighting drag, to, uh, fighting direct related violence and and crime. So we hope that uh, that uh, we will proactively spend uh, some of that uh, to. Uh, provide alternative uh, development assistance uh, to uh, opium poppy uh, uh, farmers uh, in Afghanistan and help, of course, uh, Afghanistan to uh, revitalize the agricultural sector so that uh, Afghans will have a choice to uh, cultivate uh, legal crops. Ashraf Hadari, thank you very much for being on the program this morning. Thank you so much. One of the headlines this morning in the Detroit Free Press uh, deals with a seven or eight-part series, and we're going to be talking about that in just a few seconds with one of its authors, Justin Hyde. Uh, this morning they're talking about a rare second chance. This is from the series titled Rising from the Wreckage, A Story of Survival. 
talking about uh, the resurgence of the auto industry and the economy in Detroit. We'll be talking with uh, one of the authors from the Detroit Free Press, Justin Hyde, in just a few seconds. First, we want to tell you about newsmakers this week on the program. Senate Budget uh, Committee Chairman Kent Conrad, who has proposed creating a new commission to come to grips with the $12 trillion national debt. He's going to be talking uh, right here about who should serve on that commission. Obviously, it's, it's, it's the uh, leaders of each uh, chamber that would appoint the members that would sit on this commission, but I imagine you probably have some ideas of your own. You're somebody who knows the budget process very well. Do you think you should be on this committee? <laughs> of course I do. Okay. Uh, who else, and in terms of either names or positions? Should it be appropriators or...? Uh, it, it would seem to me that uh, people who uh, need to be involved in this are the people who are involved with these issues most intimately know them the best. Those are, uh, for example, the chairman and ranking member of the Finance Committee, the chairman and ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee in the House, the chairman and ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, the chairman and ranking member of the Budget Committee, uh, representatives of leadership. Uh, seems to me those would be logical people to put on such a commission. Uh, Senator, you also want to have a couple of members of the administration on this commission, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about the reception that this idea has been getting from the administration. How enthusiastic are they about it, and, and what would their role actually be on the commission? Well, as we see it, um, in our proposal, the Secretary of the Treasury would be there representing the administration, and the administration would name one other person. I've always assumed that would be the head of the Office of Management and Budget. That would be a logical uh, a person to include. Uh, there would be bipartisan co-chairs in the proposal that Senator Gregg and I have made. On the Democratic side, the co-chair would be the Secretary of the Treasury. And uh, that would be, uh, obviously, a critically important role. But your proposal is basically for everyone to link arms and jump off the cliff together, essentially. Um, do you really think the administration is enthusiastic about that idea, particularly when the commission would be uh, taking action just at the beginning of the next presidential election cycle? You know, I can't speak for the administration. I've been in many hours of negotiations with them. They can speak very well for their own position. I do think that they're warming to the idea that there needs to be a process like this one, not necessarily this one that we've proposed, but something like it in order to effectively take on this debt threat. And you can see the entire interview with Senator Kent Conrad, chairman of the Senate Budget Committee on Newsmakers, this Sunday, tomorrow at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. on C-SPAN. It's also available right now online at cspan.org. Joining us now at the C-SPAN table is Justin Hyde, Washington correspondent with the Detroit Free Press, to talk to us about the uh, future of the auto industry, in particular about the series that's running uh, this week in the Detroit Free Press called Rising from the Wreckage. Tell us about that. Well, this is a project that's been in the works here at the Free Press for about six months now. We've got 15 reporters and about as many uh, videographers, editors, photographers uh, working on this project. It was an attempt to really tell the story of the past year in the auto industry in the state of Michigan, how it affected the economy, the people who live there, and the corporate and the cultures that, of the state. Uh, we were at the epicenter of the collapse of the auto industry over the past year. Uh, it's a place, it's a story that's affected most of all of our readers, whether they were in the auto industry or not. Uh, we wanted to go back and show how those changes affected people's lives on an individual level, and at the same time, go back and uh, really dig deep into some of the stories that you know, have developed as the year went by. You, the, there was a meeting in Pittsburgh in June of 2008, and then candidate uh, Obama said that, assuming I'm president, what would be the one or two things that the federal government can do most constructively to make certain that, in the race against time for the U.S. automakers, that you are able to make this pivot as quickly as possible? You may need some bridges to help get there. Has the president provided those bridges, and is the auto industry getting there? He's provided more bridges than I think that he ever dreamed that he'd have to, uh, going back to that May 2008 uh, visit with uh, then-GM Chairman Rick Wagner. You know, uh, about six months after that visit, Mr. Obama oversaw the ouster of Rick Wagner as chairman of GM so that his administration could lead it through bankruptcy, a move that would eventually cost the administration some $50 billion. 
At this point, uh, the government has overseen that GM and Chrysler have gone through a bankruptcy. They've come out on the other side. Their prognosis is a little uncertain still. GM's in a better position than Chrysler, but they are existing, which is far better than what the alternative was going to be had the government not stepped in. The only alternative uh, given their financial state by the end of 2008 was to go into a bankruptcy and a collapse of some variety that would have cost, by the government's own estimate, hundreds of thousands of jobs, not just the automakers, but their suppliers and their dealers as well. You had an opportunity to uh, meet with President Obama uh, earlier this month. What were his thoughts? How did they change from candidate Obama in 2008, in June of 2008, now to President Obama in December of 2009? I think uh, as president, he has been far more involved in the industry than he ever imagined he would be. And I think that it's not a position that the administration wants to keep for a very long period of time. As he told us in the interview, I've got a lot of other things to do as president. I'd love to be out of the auto industry by the time I leave office. Uh, but as he said, he'd like to, he thinks that they can build cars and trucks that people want, and that would be the key to getting them back on their feet, making them fully competitive in the world market. It's going to take several years for that to develop, however. Uh, GM's in a much better competitive position. They've got things com coming out over the next couple of years that are, at least as far as we can tell, pretty competitive with what's out there. Uh, Chrysler's more of a black box. There are a lot of changes going on there from uh, top to bottom under a new leadership from Fiat. Uh, it's going to take a couple of years for those new models to even hit the market and then for consumers to judge them. We're talking about the fu uh, future of the U.S. auto industry with Justin Hyde of the Detroit Free Press. He is their Washington correspondent, and if you want to get involved in the conversation, the number is 202-737-0002 for Republicans, Democrats 202-737-0001, Independents 202-628-0205. We've got a special line this morning for uh, auto industry workers, 202-628-0184. want to hear from uh, the folks in the uh, auto industry, particularly, um, well, not particularly this pr person, but in the series, you write about Colleen McDonald. Who is she and why was it important to include her story in this series? Uh, Colleen McDonald is a woman who owns a couple of dealerships around the Detroit area. She owned a, Chrysler, a couple of Chrysler franchises and a GM franchise as well. Uh, as we see over the course of the series, uh, she sort of feels the brunt of the downturn starting last year. Uh, she's pressured by Chrysler to try to help boost their sales in the turnaround of the year. And then as the companies go through bankruptcy, they target both of her franchises at Chrysler and GM for closure. She gets the news from Chrysler that she's going to shut down in a matter of days. The next day she gets another letter from GM saying we're going to take your dealership as well. And is this a typical situation for dealers in the Detroit area? It's a very unusual situation I think for a dealer to have uh, franchises called from both companies. However, there were a couple thousand dealers who were essentially affected by the decision to reduce the dealer count at both GM and Chrysler. Uh, it's an activity that's not gone on before in the domestic auto industry. It was painful for a lot of them. It spawned a political fight here on Capitol Hill that was just resolved last week when a bill attached to the spending bill allowed dealers to go back to the companies and uh, petition for some binding arbitration over how the companies chose which dealers to close. Our first call for Justin Hyde of the Detroit Free Press comes from River Falls, Wisconsin. Tom on our line for Republicans an auto industry retiree. Tom, what did you do in the auto industry before you retired? I was in uh, material handling. Okay. Um, do you know that right now there are more auto industry jobs in the United States than there have previously has been? It's just that they're not in the, the Detroit area anymore because you got down south, there's a lot of plants uh, all over. The, during the negotiations with the union, the union did great. For the for the auto for the workers, but the the thing is, was when the they take a, uh, a vote for a um, or we would for a strike if we didn't get what we want. Well, the the company would say we'll give them what they want now, and we'll worry about it later. Now it's later. The union and Gilfinger, they should have went back, to, sat down with the company and said, okay. We're going to, we know to help save this auto industry, we're going to have to maybe give a little back to the companies and then we'll go proceed later on down the road with negotiations to make it better for the union worker. But the unions are being stubborn. It's hurting Detroit. It's hurting Detroit terrible. Now, um, I don't know what they're going to do. Ford Motor Company is doing good. You know, to stop and, and think about it, they did a buyout of a lot of the plants and paid off the workers, but they, and I think they 
I'm not going to say this for sure, but I think they asked the union to back down a little bit to help the Ford Motor Company pick up and get going again, which happened. Um, General Motors, Chrysler, they should do the same thing and, and, and have the union work better with the company to help for everybody. And thanks a lot, c -SPAN. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, it's very interesting what happened with the union over this process. The UAW and President Ron Gettelfinger were deeply involved in this whole issue. And uh, not, you know, while they were part of the negotiations, they had to take haircuts as well. Uh, the UAW has a no-strike clause now at GM and Chrysler. It doesn't matter what happens now between now and about 2013. They cannot go on strike to change their contract. The other major concession the UAW gave up was that for retirees, perhaps such as yourself, uh, their health care is now tied into an investment in GM and Chrysler. The health care trust for retirees at the UAW owns a majority of Chrysler. They have a smaller stake at GM. 1.1 million people will be, will be depending on those investments for their health care come January of this year. That's a major risk for uh, an industry that hasn't produced returns for shareholders in a number of decades. Uh, those benefits are going to have to be cut over time. The concession is equal to tens of billions of dollars. But it was necessary in order to get these companies to a position where they had enough debt that they weren't going to choke themselves. Our next call for Justin Hyde of the Detroit Free Press comes from Melissa in the Florida Keys. Go ahead. Hi, I, I appreciate uh, you taking the time. And I, I just want to say that if anybody wants to listen to YouTube, Obama conspiracy, which uh, I'm going to try to tie this in, unfortunately. But I did listen to what you were saying about how uh, Obama did purchase all the um, automotive companies. And Melissa, and again, I'd like to say yes. I'm sorry, but YouTube Obama conspiracy. And Sound a little distracted there. Tell us a little bit more about what the the point she was trying to make, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> well. Uh the government has put in about $80 billion into the domestic auto industry between GM, Chrysler, and their, and their former financial arms, GMAC and Chrysler Financial. Uh, right now, the last estimate from the government is that they probably won't get back about $30 billion of that money that they've put in. It's simply gone. Uh, the companies were in such bad shape around the end of last year that the money was basically there just to keep the doors open. Uh, the Obama administration has, has admitted that. They've been up front. They thought that there's a certain loss they're going to take. Their goal, they've said, is to get out as soon as possible in a way that tries to balance the amount of money they can get back for the shares that they own in GM and Chrysler, but at the same time gets the government's hand out. Uh, there is a lot of political pressure around the government owning a majority of GM and a smaller stake in Chrysler. Uh, it opens the door to sort of political interference, not just from the federal government, but from other agencies. And I think the Obama administration wants to in close that door as soon as possible. Was there anything that Congress or any administration, either the Bush administration or the Obama administration, could, was there anything that they could do to save the auto industry before it bottomed out in 2008 or was it something that had to happen and then take a look at it and see how we can restructure this and bring the auto industry back? It was really the credit crisis in 08 that pushed the industry off a cliff. It, these domestic automakers had been kind of struggling along for years. They'd been able to push their reckoning days further into the future by borrowing against future earnings. So they were able to increase, it was, you know, a lot like some people, a lot like a lot of people in the country, you know, when you get in trouble, if you had a credit card or something, you could put that on the, you could put your debts on the credit card and keep, live to fight another day. That's essentially what was happening at these companies. Until the credit crunch happened, they had to deal with that debt load, and it turned out the only way to do that was bankruptcy, either with the government's help or without. Our next call comes from Tom on our line for independence out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, hi. Um, the L.A. Auto Show uh, was last week, and there were some interesting things there. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, a turbine-powered uh, car that Richard Hillman um, built himself. It's supposed to have a 500-mile range. And I, I, I wonder if you could talk about maybe the future of uh, micro-turbines as range extenders in plug-in electric vehicles. Sure. Uh, turbines are sort of this um, jumped-over technology. The automakers were really interested in them back in sort of the late to mid-60s, uh, and Chrysler even built a couple of uh, prototype turbine-powered cars. Uh, there are collector's items now. Uh, but it turned out that they were expensive, a little loud, and that you could get a lot of the same benefits by improving gasoline engines. So uh, they've been sort of shuttled aside for the moment. They're getting another look again, as you say, for range extenders in electric vehicles. Uh, they would, these are sort of 
engines and motors that would be put into essentially electric cars. They wouldn't power the wheels, they would power a generator that would power a battery pack that would power the wheels. It sounds a little complicated, but it's this process that GM's going to use in the Chevrolet Volt. Uh, we're seeing some people experiment with them. It's possible they could come back, but it's still something of a, of a nascent technology. I think more people are still looking at a plain old uh, internal combustion engine, similar to what we have today, either gas or diesel first, before they get back to something like turbines. So is the auto industry seriously looking at uh, electric cars or alternative powered cars, or is it just something to placate the government and the public until the price of gas comes down and it makes cars uh, easier to afford? It is a serious effort. Every automaker in the world has some kind of electric car program underway and they're studying them closely. It is not, uh, regulations are certainly a big part of it. They're a reason that they're driving it here in the United States and elsewhere, but it's not just regulations. Last year there was a gas price spike that affected the entire country uh, and the world as well, and I think that put a lot of fear into automakers that it, finally, if the technology was in reach to break the dependence upon foreign oil, uh, you had to reach out for it. In addition, uh, regulations regarding global warming and carbon intensity are getting stronger around the world as well. Uh, that's going to play a role in moving electric cars forward. Electric cars in general should be better on, on carbon than what we have today. Next up, Granger, Indiana. Robert, on our line for Republicans. You're on the Washington Journal. Good morning. Uh, you know, this electric car thing, I, I think they're trying to tell people that they're not going to be able to take vacations anymore unless you're going to get out every 50 miles and plug it in. You know, this is a... a just turn around and look out the window. This global warming stuff is a scam. I mean, uh, you got a governor there in Michigan. I, I worked in Michigan a little bit. You got a governor there, and she's got the highest unemployment rate, and Obama's got her around advising him how to create jobs. What, what kind of people are we dealing with? Thank you. Sure. Well, uh, as far as global warming, it's for real as far as scientists can tell at this point. In terms of electric cars, there's going to be a variety of cars, and you're right. Right now, the ones that are available are very expensive and have very short ranges. Uh, the prototypes that we've seen uh, get the cost down a little bit, but they still are far more expensive than what you see from a regular vehicle, and the ranges are somewhat limited. Uh, the market for them is going to be cities. It's going to be people who don't necessarily drive that much, but still need a vehicle to get around. And because cities are growing, the potential market for electric cars is growing as well. Uh, right now, with gas prices, they're not that competitive unless you get some kind of government help. But if gas goes up back to $4 a gallon, which, you know, everyone hopes it doesn't, but it's possible that it could, uh, electric cars start making a lot more sense, especially for people who take short trips. That said, I think you'll always be able to find some kind of vehicle to take that long trip in in the United States for many decades to come. How has Governor Jennifer Granholm's administration performed uh, in assisting the auto industry come back, and how has she worked as a uh, go-between between the auto industry and the Obama administration? Well, that's one of the things that we focus on in the series, and especially uh, our, our story today talks about how uh, Governor Granholm has been really pressing the Obama administration to try to help the industry, not just through the bankruptcies, but through a variety of things, such as tax credits for uh, uh, green manufacturing, uh, aid to workers who have been laid off from the industry. And that, uh, for example, you know, she was apparently daily emailing to the administration the number of calls coming in to Michigan's unemployment hotline. Uh, as the caller said, Michigan does have the highest unemployment rate in the country. It has had that since May of 2004. It's been uh, sort of leading the nation, unfortunately, in going down into an economic crisis. Uh, and as we say in today's story, when General Motors went bankrupt, she was very concerned that uh, it sort of foreclosed the possibility of a comeback for Michigan while she was governor. We're talking with Justin Hyde of the Detroit Free Press. Uh, he is the Washington correspondent and has been with the uh, Free Press for how long? Uh, since November of 05. And how long in Washington? Uh, since uh, 2003. Focusing primarily on the auto industry and its relationship with Washington, D.C.? Yeah, ever since I've been with the Free Press. Our next call comes from Lyon, South Lyon, Michigan. Daniel on our line for independence. Um, I just want to make a comment. I think the auto industry uh, has basically uh, been dissolving since uh, Ronald Reagan was in office. Uh, he initially started NAFTA. Um, ever since then, um, uh, the auto industry has been going downhill fast. Uh, I went through four plant closings uh, since then, and uh, it's getting worse and worse and worse here. Uh, uh, thank you. Hey, Daniel, what kind of work were you doing there in South Lyon? 
Uh, well, right now I'm unemployed, um, unfortunately. Before <laughs> I used that. to be a production supervisor, material handler, uh, assembler, um, all this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, basically, we were suppliers to the big three. And uh, all these jobs, you know, since NASA went down to Mexico and, uh, you know, areas like that, um, you know, the latest plant closings we had, um, they were all up here. But the ones down in uh, Mexico, they stayed open. So, you know, NAFTA, I think, uh, was the beginning of the end. Right. Well, and, and Daniel's experience is similar to uh, some of the experiences we wrote about in the project, and, on, and unfortunately for a lot of people in Michigan, uh, you know, in the past, if, if the turmoil was, was not nearly as great, and if you did lose a job, there would be another job available. There simply hasn't been the kind of jobs backfilling into Michigan that are not attached to the industry for folks such as him. Uh, and he does have a point about uh, trade and NAFTA, a lot, especially in the supplier industry. A lot of those jobs have been affected by offshoring to foreign countries, either Mexico or China. Unfortunately, it's a trend that may continue as well. We had a discussion about manufacturing in, uh, with the White House earlier this week, and trade and currency are two of the sort of untractable issues at this point that, that a lot of experts say have to be dealt with uh, before you can get started about talking about adding manufacturing jobs back in the United States. Right now, the U.S. has fewer people working in manufacturing than it did before World War II. The uh, eight-part series is called Rising from the Wreckage. If you want to uh, read it in its entirety, you can find it online at Freep. Dot com. Back to the phones, Fort Lauderdale, Scott on our line for Democrats. Go ahead. Okay, hi, thanks. Yeah, well, you've touched on a number of subjects here. Uh, one of the things I'd like to make a comment on is the disparity between uh, health care systems in Japan versus uh, USA. Japan's auto manufacturing industry doesn't seem to be suffering like ours. And they have a national health care system, which uh, only, I think, about 7% of GDP there. And uh, everybody is covered. I think a family of four's uh, annual uh, monthly premiums are about $280 a month. Of course, we know we've been debating health care in this country. So I think until we solve that uh, situation, that uh, we'll be at a disadvantage when it comes to foreign manufacturing. Uh, I might also have a question about the, uh, the re why can't we get the high mileage cars like you see in Europe? I know Fiat has a, a little car that gets tremendous mileage. Volkswagen had a little uh, two- or three-cylinder diesel that was getting 60 or 70 miles a gallon. I uh, sure would like to see that kind of thing here. And you mentioned the electric car. I remember there was a big, uh, big hub-hub about the Ford Ranger electric truck, and a bunch of guys staged a protest out there in front of the dealership and all that, and they were finally allowed to keep their trucks. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> well, uh, you do have a point on health care. Uh, you're right. A lot of people have pointed out the fact that other nations with strong manufacturing sectors have nationalized health care to some degree, while the United States does not. Uh, it's been a factor, but it's not as if the, the jobs that the a lot of the jobs the United States have, has lost so far in manufacturing have gone to those industri other industrialized nations. A lot of the manufacturing jobs that have left the United States have gone to lower cost countries like China and Mexico. Uh, healthcare is a factor, especially for startup businesses. Uh, there has been some involvement with the industry on the healthcare debate in Capitol Hill, especially by the UAW. Uh, it's one of those issues that I think plays a role, but so far, uh, as, at least as far as the healthcare debate goes here, it's not been an overarching role. Uh, your second point about you know high mileage cars from Europe, uh, you're going to get your wish granted here in a couple of years. Uh, most automakers are looking at bringing in smaller, higher mileage cars, especially from Europe. The Ford Fiesta is going to go on sale next year. Fiat will bring in the car that you mentioned, the Fiat 500. They'll build the engine in Michigan. Uh, they'll assemble the car in Mexico and sell it here in the United States, uh, I believe starting by the end of next year. Uh, it's something of an experiment to see how much demand there is among Americans for the kind of smaller, higher mileage vehicles that dominate the European market. And like we said before, the opportunity seems to be as a hedge against gas prices, as a concern over mileage, and as more people live in cities and perhaps don't have to drive as much as a typical suburban American does today. There were several articles in uh, various papers this morning that were similar to this one. Uh, GM to close down Saab after failing to find a buyer. Is that going to have a significant, fence, uh, significant effect on this rise from the wreckage that you're talking about in the Detroit Free Press? Uh, at this point, no. Saab has been uh, sort of outside of GM for some time. They've been working on trying to find a buyer or winding it down the operations. It's going to affect Sweden. There will be a couple thousand jobs lost there. Uh, this was a deal that GM tried to put together as part of the bankruptcy and the buyer fell through. They tried to find another buyer and it simply wasn't able to find one. Uh, it's sort of the second brand that's gone through this. They had a similar thing happen with Saturn 
where they had sort of an outside buyer that was going to try to take over the company, keep it in business selling vehicles. That deal fell through as well. It goes to sort of the weakness in the global auto industry. There is simply far more capacity to build cars in the world than there are buyers to buy them at this point. Our last call for this segment comes from Finger Lakes, New York, on our line for Republicans. Ham? Hi there. How are you this morning? Just fine. Go ahead, Good. sir. You got any snow there? Uh, take a look out uh, behind me. There. <laughs> I see it, yeah. We got a little bit. I got a comment and a couple questions. I wish I had bought Ford back in March. I see it's <laughs> from a dollar to almost $10 now. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, why is it would, do we think that Ford is so, was so much better positioned than Chrysler or General Motors? And the second question would be, uh, what would have occurred uh, had GM and Chrysler just gone Chapter 11 as opposed to what's occurring today? Sure. Um, I'll take your answers offline, and I thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Uh, two uh, answers there. First off, Ford tackled a lot of this overhaul that GM and Chrysler were going through well before the credit crisis. It mortgaged itself to the hilt, borrowed more than $20 billion, uh, and created sort of this nest egg that would survive through the downturn. And secondly, it brought in a new CEO, Alan Mulally from Boeing, who tackled some of the long-standing issues that were keeping the company back. Uh, he addressed labor costs, and more importantly, he basically made the company act like it was one company. Uh, Ford used to basically act like four or five different companies that would operate differently depending on where you were in the world. He managed to stitch those units together and uh, make the company profitable. Ford is the only automaker, uh, Detroit automaker at the moment, able to make money selling cars in the United States. Uh, as your second question, what would happen with the standard Chapter 11? Uh, neither company had the money to go through a Chapter 11 process. They were expecting it would take tens of billions of dollars more than what the government put in. Had they gone in, uh, the process probably would have looked like what happened to the parts supplier Delphi, which is just now trying to get out of bankruptcy after more than four years. Uh, you would have seen something close to a uncontrolled shutdown of Chrysler and GM that might have rippled through their suppliers, through their dealers, and through the businesses that depend on that economic activity. Uh, it was fair to say that, uh, you know, forecasts of a calamity were probably not that far off. Justin Hyde of the Detroit Free Press, thank you very much for being on the program. Well, thank you for having me, Rob. Earlier this week in the New York Times, under this story with the headline, Clinton outlines Obama's agile agenda on rights, is this quote from our next guest. The world still looks to the United States to be a force in human rights, said Michael Posner, an assistant secretary of state who oversees human rights. He goes on to say, but we are in a world where governments as a whole have less power than they once did. Let's take the world as we know, let's take the world as we now see it. We're going to talk more about that with Michael Posner in just a few seconds. But first, we want to take a look at the past week through the eyes of a few of the nation's editorial cartoonists. Washington Journal continues. Michael Posner is Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy and Human Rights and joins us from New York City. Good morning, sir. 
Good morning. Tell us, in your opinion, why has the Obama administration been criticized for lagging on human rights? I, I think that the, uh, there are some who view the administration as not embracing uh, these issues as aggressively as we should, and I think that's just wrong. There's been a determination, certainly from President Obama and Secretary Clinton from the get-go, to say that issues of human rights and democracy are really an essential piece of our foreign policy. The speech that she made uh, last week at uh, Georgetown University uh, comes on the heels of the speech that the president made um, at the uh, uh, military academy at West Point. Tell us how those two speeches balance out as far as uh, uh, dealing with human rights and, uh, and foreign policy overseas. Well, actually, the president also uh, last week spoke at Oslo and accepted the Nobel uh, Prize. And he spoke both about the need for the United States to act militarily in, in Afghanistan, as we are, but at the same time maintain a commitment to human rights and justice. I think one of the challenges we face in the world is that there are multiple uh, needs and agendas for us. But the key for us is, to tr again, to take the world as we, as we find it and find ways uh, to push a human rights agenda on a parallel track with economic, political, diplomatic, and other security interests. So there is, uh, in our view, a, a need to insert human rights and uh, maintain a human rights policy uh, in all countries of the world. The uh, Secretary spoke about the administration's commitment to human rights last Monday at Georgetown University. This is part of what she had to say. First, a commitment to human rights starts with universal standards and with holding everyone accountable to those standards, including ourselves. On his second full day in office, President Obama issued an executive order prohibiting the use of torture or official cruelty by any U.S. official and ordered the closure of Guantanamo Bay. Next year, we will report on human trafficking, as we do every year, but this time not only just on other countries, but also on our own. And we will participate through the United Nations in the universal periodic review of our own human rights record, just as we encourage other nations to do. By holding ourselves accountable, we reinforce our moral authority to demand that all governments adhere to obligations under international law, among them not to torture arbitrarily detain and persecute dissenters or engage in political killings. Our government and the international community must counter the pretensions of those who deny or abdicate their responsibilities and hold violators to account. Mr. Posner, so what's the administration's plan going forward? How, how will they hold other countries accountable for human rights as well as holding ourselves accountable? Well, I think uh, important in what she said is that we have to start with a notion that there is a single standard and that we're going to apply it to ourselves as well. Uh, it's best to lead by example. <clears throat> and what we're doing, what the president did in the second day in uh, announcing the closure of Guantanamo, announcing no more official cruelty, that sent a very strong signal to the world. We have to follow through on those things. We still have a ways to go in the closure of Guantanamo. We have a lot to do in terms of reviewing our own record across a broad range of issues, and that we're determined to do. With that as a basis, though, we can and we are going out to other governments and saying, we expect you to do the same. Every government in the world, for example, has to submit to this periodic review of the United Nations. We're pushing that, and we're making sure that as, as governments come up and, and are being reviewed, we're, we're making sure that those reviews are more serious than they've been in the past. Um, we're also on a bilateral level going to governments. Uh, in the last several months, uh, I've probably talked to uh, 15 or 16 governments about very specific things on our agenda on human rights. I met with government of uh, Uzbekistan yesterday, the government of Egypt. Um, we're, we're really taking each country and saying, we have an agenda. It's an agenda based on not U.S. standards, but a universal declaration of human rights concept of what human rights are. We're talking about the Obama administration's human rights agenda. 
with Michael Posner, Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy and Human Rights. And if you'd like to get involved in our conversation, the number is 202-737-0001 for uh, Republicans, Democrats 202-737-0002, and Independents 202-628-0205. And if you're calling outside the United States, the uh, number is 202 628 zero one eight four what's been the response so far from the countries that you've spoken directly with about uh, readjusting and asserting this new human rights policy well to be sure these are hard issues uh, most governments are very sensitive when you raise questions about treatment of dissenters or free press or their political process to be sure uh, but I think the approach we're taking is based on the notion not that we're imposing our uh, American standards on them, but we're working from a universal standard as we just talked about, but also the change occurs from within societies. And so our primary focus is often uh, how to help uh, create space for members of civil society, for human rights groups, for women's groups, for the media to operate within their own societies and raise these issues in a way that's consistent with their own culture, history, background. Uh, often that's the hardest part of the discussion, but it's the most important. And I think there is a recognition on our part uh, that the thing that we can do that's going to make the most difference is to create a, uh, an open uh, political and uh, social process that allows human rights and democracy to flourish in every country in the world. That's the theory and I think governments, they don't like some of the details of the conversation, but it's harder to argue with that premise. Our first call for Michael Posner comes from Daytona Beach, Florida. Tim, on our line for Democrats. Yes, I saw what they were saying about human rights. The, the war that we're fighting. Yeah. And I just, you know, I'm a hardworking man. I pay my taxes. Um, and it's like, when are you guys going to take time out to help us, U.S. citizens. I said, because we're struggling out here. I'm a single dad. I take care of my child. I said, there's nothing out here to help us. Tim, how is taking care of human rights, both here and abroad, taking away from your ability to take care of your family? Tim? Afghanistan, really, we have no business over there. If you read the Bible, the Bible is quite clear about that. Hello? Yeah, all right, we're going to leave it there. Uh, Mr. Posner, did you want to comment on that? No, obviously, the, uh, to me, the Obama administration is doing a range of things on the domestic front to try to address jobs, health, etc. cetera. Um, my place in the government is really to try uh, more globally to uh, address some of those same issues by creating a stronger democratic institutions in, in other countries. In the uh, article in uh, last Tuesday's uh, New York Times, they talk about critics pointing out that the State Department has cut funding for several nonprofit groups that track human rights abuses in Iran, though others say these groups had little to do with ad advancing democracy there. Can you tell us a little bit about that situation? Yeah, you know, we are in a place like Iran, a very closed society where we don't have a, a diplomatic presence. Uh, our, it's very challenging to figure out how to best influence uh, a change. And yet change is clearly occurring there. And there is a growing dissatisfaction with the government. Uh, after the uh, elections earlier this year, there were street demonstrations. Those demonstrations continue. We've done a range of things quietly to support uh, uh, those who are, uh, are pushing for change without becoming so public about it that we become part of the government's uh, story. The government would like to demonize the United States and say that everybody who is opposing its uh, policies is a, is a tool of the United States. We don't uh, subscribe to that. It's certainly not true. One of the things that we've done in particular is to uh, work with uh, those who are trying to use new media, the internet, etc. Uh, one of the uh, things that happened when those street demonstrations took place is that people were texting each other using Twitter. Uh, and a young uh, State Department official found out, realized that Twitter was going to shut down for servicing at a critical moment. 
and he called up and made sure that the uh, the service stayed open. So we're looking for new ways to allow people in Iran to speak to one another and to amplify their voices on the international stage. It's a critically important time there and we're very involved in a range of ways. Speaking of Twitter, we have this message from uh, someone who identifies themselves as C-SPAN junkie writing, sanctions in Iraq killed scores of thousands of children. Isn't Hillary planning sanctions on Iran? Doesn't that hurt government? Uh, doesn't hurt government, but uh, hurts the people. Well, you know, there is a, uh, a wide-ranging review now of how to deal with Iran, in particular in the context of the nuclear, uh, the danger of their becoming a nuclear power. And sanctions are certainly one of the things that's being discussed. But what I'm saying is that however that discussion goes, from my perspective, the real, uh, the real opportunity that we have now is that the Iranian government is increasingly unpopular with its own people. There's a great frustration, especially among young people, uh, that they're living in a society that's heading downward. And so it's in our interest, again, informally and indirectly, to be amplifying the voices of those who seek change and who are trying to promote a more democratic, more rights-respecting uh, uh, a state. And so for whatever we can do to encourage that kind of a debate to go on and to support people who are in the middle of that, I think we ought to be doing. Next up is David on our line for, I'm sorry, for on our line for Republicans, calling out of Peoria, Illinois. Go ahead. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, what was interesting is, on several notes when President Obama went to China and obviously didn't even bring up human rights and yet it's postured that it's one of his key you know focuses of an administration and it just the and again with opportunities in Iran I mean Iran already calls the United States the great Satan they already want to kill us and so I guess at what point um, does kind of lip service to human rights to actually doing something and it's not so much me being critical of, uh, of the administration but when you see your governmental leader say one thing and then not do anything and you say you're taking a soft approach a quiet approach well who cares because it's not effective and and so I, it, it seems cowardly in my mind and so you know when you see this going on you just wonder you know, it's, it's more lip service than anything, and then if something does happen, then you guys will take credit, even though you didn't do a thing. Michael Posner. Well, you know, I, I don't accept that on a couple of levels. Uh, first of all, with respect to China, uh, President Obama did visit China recently and had a range of conversations, both privately and publicly, that uh, addressed human rights issues. Uh, we continue to be concerned about uh, the situation in Tibet. We continue to be very concerned as well about the uh, plight of the Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, we're, we're concerned about religious freedom. We're concerned about prisoners and their treatment. Uh, these are all issues we're going to continue to raise. The president has and will continue to raise. Uh, he spoke at a public meeting in Shanghai uh, and talked about uh, to students there about the importance of openness and uh, again on the internet uh, uh, the ability of people to speak their minds um, we're engaged with the Chinese on a range of fronts but human rights issues are very much part of that discussion and will continue to be and again one of the things that I find well, both President Obama and Secretary Clinton are very pragmatic people we talk about principled pragmatism we are looking to get results not to just uh, uh, speak rhetorically and to say things that sound uh, like we, uh, you know, are, are being strong. We want to get results, and so in China, in Iran, and elsewhere, we're trying to see where are there opportunities actually to push an agenda that's going to get a result and help real people in their lives. Next up is Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Ronald on our line for Democrats. Go ahead. Yes, when he was a senator. President Obama took a high-profile trip to Africa, and among other places, he visited Darfur. But now, as a president, we don't hear much from him regarding the issue of Darfur. Probably, I know that the U.S. might be working some things and all that kind of stuff. But this type of uh, low-profile posture that he has assumed as a president, it really does not serve well, does not bode well. 
And just what is exactly the Obama administration currently doing to deal with this issue of Darfur in Africa? Well, as you, uh, as you say, Darfur is one of the most serious crises that we face in Africa or anywhere in the world. Uh, 300,000 people at least have died, uh, been killed. Uh, several million people are internally displaced and, and millions more have been forced to flee across the border into Chad. Um, there is uh, a, an envoy, a special envoy, uh, the president appointed General uh, Scott Gratian, who's working more broadly on Sudanese issues. One of the challenges in Sudan is that not only is there a crisis in Darfur, but there's also a coming apart of a, what had been a very fragile peace between the north and the south. And so part of the challenge is to both deal with, a, with that e emerging crisis and at the same time focus on the continuing tragedy in Darfur. You're absolutely right. It is a crisis. It is a very depressing situation. It's a humanitarian crisis. We're trying to deal with the humanitarian side and at the same time try to find a broader political solution. And I should add that we're also supportive of the efforts of the International Criminal Court, which has brought an indictment against President Bashir of Sudan. So it's a, it, we've got a lot of things going on there, but f not for one second do we believe that, we're, that enough uh, has been done. We know that there's a crisis and we know we need to address it. Our next call for Michael Posner comes from Bill in South Omaha, Nebraska. Say, uh, well, first off, Merry Christmas. Um, say, you use the term principal pragma pragmatism. Uh, that is a contradiction in terms, I will suggest to you. But outside of that, you started out this conversation talking about uh, that uh, the United States was willing to admit to the United Nations that we have, and I don't agree with you, but tortured people. But then you went on to say that, that the United States was going to evaluate several, several other things. Well, you evade. You were, very, you were not specific at all about what those other things were, and I probably would disagree with you. But there's one more thing, and that is <clears throat> it appears to me that what you're talking about when you talk about rights is not the, not the rights that we have in the Bill of Rights. What you were talking about is a new set of rights that are wanting to be, want to be created. And I will just say that when Obama goes around the world bowing, what that is is the altruistic tendon of uh, self-sacrifice. And what he is really doing is he's sacrificing the American taxpayer or the American people. And we'll leave it there. Michael Posner. Well, I have a couple reactions to that. Uh, first of all, I think when we look at ourselves, uh, we're not doing it from a position of weakness. We're doing it from a position of strength. Uh, this is a country founded on principles of human rights and democracy. It, they're part of, this is part of our DNA. And it's, uh, it served us well for 230 years to be a leader on human rights in our own society. Uh, th the idea that we would continue to improve our society only strengthens that perception and it makes us more capable and more effective as we go out in the world. Uh, the second thing is that I think the uh, uh, the notion of principal pragmatism is exactly the right way to approach these issues, and I don't think it's a contradiction. Uh, we are not saying that we've abandoned our principles. In fact, we're living our principles in our foreign policy. We're pushing for things like the right of people to practice their own religion and to speak freely and to participate in a political process. Those are things we believe in. We say them internationally as well as at home. And we are very determined to do it in a way that's going to get a practical result. I don't want to just, uh, we want to make a difference, not just make a point. And so for us, it's really important that we try to figure out how do we apply those principles in a way that's going to make a difference in people's lives. We're talking with Michael Posner, Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy and Human Rights. He has a BA from the University of Michigan and a JD from the University of California at Berkeley Law School. Our next call comes from Statesville, North Carolina, on our line for Republicans. Ron, go ahead. Hey, good morning. Yeah, I've, I've read articles about uh, poor women in Europe uh, almost being sold into slavery and prostitution, and a lot of time they're culprits are uh, Jews and they're from Israel yet you know in the UN we always walk out if anybody says anything about uh, Israel or so uh, I, I guess we turn our back on this, this Ron have you really on. seen any evidence of this 
I've read articles about this. Where? In, in magazines over the years. What I mean, magazine? Give me a magazine. I've seen it on TV before. Where? These Ron, we're going to move on to uh, Alcorn, Wisconsin. Clayton on our line for Democrats. Go ahead. Clayton? Clayton, are you with me? Yeah, I am. Turn down your television. This uh, process will work a lot better if you do, okay? Okay, yeah, I have it turned off. Okay. So, um, I guess well, what my my question or you know, um, you know, the torture has been, you know, waterboarding has been determined as torture and long before, you know, you know, Obama made, you know, declared that it was torture and we weren't going to do it anymore. And we got Cheney, you know, running around the country advocating at the top of his lungs that um, we should be um, torturing and doing more of this. You know, we we um, don't want other countries or other people, you know, doing it to us. But yet here we are doing it knowingly that we shouldn't be doing it. And I guess my question is, why didn't anything ever, you know, come about on Cheney for even today, still advocating at the top of his lungs. Michael Posner. Uh, I, I should say, before I uh, came into government, and I've just been in the position a little over three months, uh, I worked for many years, 30 years actually, with a private human rights organization called Human Rights First. And I probably spent more time in the last six or seven years before uh, coming to this job working on issues of human rights and national security and the issue of torture and cruel treatment was at the center of that. I came into this government precisely because I believed and I do believe that this administration has turned a page on that. The president's declaration that we won't engage in cruel treatment uh, is in fact uh, what this administration is doing and we intend to make it uh, the policy and the law of the United States going forward for, for all time. Though we made terrible mistakes and they hurt us in the world uh, by engaging in cruel practices. Uh, the issue of looking back is a more complicated one, but we've begun to do that in some, in several ways. Uh, uh, the Attorney General has appointed a special prosecutor, in effect, uh, to look at uh, some of the abuses by uh, individual CIA or intelligence uh, uh, officers uh, in the previous administration. I think over time there are going to be other ways in which we can evaluate what happened in the past. But we have to be clear the purpose of doing that is to prevent a reoccurrence or future uh, leaders or, or in future situations are uh, uh, deciding that that again is the right policy. We should never and no government should engage in official cruelty and interrogations. And as long as I'm in the government, that's going to be a priority for me to make sure that we adhere to that at home and, and push for that around the world. Next up is Alberto calling on our line for independence from Palm Coast, Florida. Yes, good morning, Mr. Posner. Uh, as a good Cuban, morning. I have been following uh, the development of some of the things that your department have been pushing in my country such as turning uh, Joanny Sanchez and others into a goddess um, by giving them instruments uh, that you spoke about before to improve communication. My question to you, have anyone evaluated that behind that there's a potential of developing strife within the country? And I say that because as a supporter of the civil rights in the 60s, we refrained from getting involved directly in encouraging, promoting, or supporting the civil rights movement. How would you feel had we, uh, as a small country, provided uh, civil rights fighters or movement with material or otherwise support, uh, maybe in Alabama, as an example? Alberto, we'll leave it there. Mr. Posner, you got the last word. Uh, you know, I, again, <clears throat> I think the, the United States and, and, and any country uh, welcomes, ought to welcome uh, those who are uh, supporting efforts, peaceful efforts, nonviolent efforts to promote uh, uh, open debate about issues of human rights and democracy. And likewise, I think we're totally appropriate when we 
reach out to human rights defenders, when we reach out to support uh, independent uh, journalists, uh, religious leaders, etc., who are in a nonviolent way expressing the desire for freedom and justice. Again, that's part of our history. It's consistent with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's the, really the only way or the principal way that things are going to change in the world. So I think our policy of engaging from, uh, with people within societies and giving them a greater voice uh, is the best way forward. Michael Posner, thank you very much for being on the Washington Journal this morning. Thank you for having me. We are now going to check in by phone with Alex Wayne. Alex Wayne is a staff writer with Congressional Quarterly, and he's uh, going to be talking with us for a couple of minutes, giving us an update on the health care debate happening on the